welcome Johnny Wright and Ralph Simon. So Johnny, this is really great. Toronto, here we are. I've come all the way in from Florida. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jeremy Silver, thank you very much for a, a very you. lucid, uh, very nice uh, introduction, good introduction. And uh, Johnny, just a great to be uh, back with you again. Uh, the last time we were together was on the other side of the world in Singapore. Right. And what we're going to do is to take you through a very interesting way of showing you exactly the breadth of WEG. How many of you know what a WEG is? Wow, one. one. Thank you very much. So a WEG is, the, as you can see on the screen, the right entertainment group. It is right. It is great. And Johnny is the right in right. So if you're looking for Mr. Right, here's your man. Okay, so... Uh, hey, I have some females in my life that will, you know, dispute that. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I thought we would do is we'd start this off by showing you a place where a lot of the world's greatest talent is actually nurtured and developed. And when you see it, this, uh, this will give you some kind of idea of how things start. Because what I wanted to be able to get across to you was that Johnny and his vision for the future and his vision of developing music, talent, and things for screenagers. Because today, in today's modern world, you have to appeal to people who look at their screens. So Johnny, first of all, we'll start off by uh, just taking a look and uh, this picture here, now that looks like it could be a timeshare in Florida, doesn't it? Who would think that in a building like that, uh, something really magical will be created? So Johnny, uh, wh where is this? Uh, this is in Orlando, Florida. We call it the compound. And it's 16,000 square feet of, of facility. It sits on a 700 acre ski lake. And as you'll see other pictures, we have jet skis and motorboats and all type of things there for it. <clears throat> we have a, water uh, a pool with waterfalls and an observation deck so you can kind of look out over the lake that we have. So Johnny, what's amazing about this is when you look at this, you just don't think that inside those walls is this incredible creative fireplace that's building talent that's going to have a global and uh, massive North American impact. No, it looks like a place that you would just go hang out and vacation in Orlando and go to Disney World for sure. Okay, well, some of the people that have been developed in Johnny's compound have made uh, waves uh, all over the world and have made some very substantial waves. And just to give you some kind of idea, there's one of uh, Johnny's uh, clients that he's been involved with for many, many years. Uh, where was that picture taken, Johnny? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's definitely not the Grammys. Uh, yeah, actually, Academy that is the Grammys. the Grammys. That's the Grammys, yes. And there, there's Justin uh, looking uh, quite quizzical there, but uh, the two of you oh, looking see. very smart there, Johnny. It's uh, clearly a big night because uh, Justin always uh, someone who's made an impact both at the Grammys and, of course, now as a film actor. And you were responsible for developing his career right from the very, very beginning when he was still within sync. Absolutely. It's been a great ride. And one thing I must say about him, too, the same 12 and a half year old that I met back then in the same guy who was hungry and was like a sponge. He was always the first one into rehearsals and first one you know, into the recording studio and last one to leave is the same guy, I won't tell his age now, but so many years later, he's still that same guy. He's still hungry. He never believed that he's made it and he's always striving to better what his last move was. And that's why we have a great relationship together because you know he doesn't think of himself as a star. He's always hungry. And I love any artist that's constantly wanting, wanting excuse me, to outdo what their last accomplishment was. So just to give you an idea, he had a seven-year hiatus from music, making a movie, getting involved in Hollywood, and successfully so. And then you brought him back because you basically came up with the architecture for his album called The 2020 Vision, right? 2020 Experience. 2020 Experience, as you can see on the screen. Now, just have a look at that, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the gross on that touring revenue. That's a lot of money. But it also shows that this young kid that Johnny started working with at 12 and a half years old, just tell us just briefly uh, about the album. The album did really well. How many hit singles did you have on the album? 
Um, we ended up having four hit singles off the album. The album sold 960,000 copies in the first week of um, release in the United States and has gone on to sell over four million records across the world. The interesting thing about that, that particular record is, is that he didn't tell me he was making it because he knew that once he told me he was in the studio, I would start creating all these ideas to put him to work. And having a seven year hiatus from the music business, a lot of, you know, this, this, the theory of out of sight, out of mind, um, we always thought that nobody would be interested in this. So when we went into this, when he finally told me he was in the studio, he had already been working with Timberland. He only had 21 days to work on the record because he had to go shoot a movie. And in 21 days, they had three studios working and he made 26 songs. So, you know, those 26 songs were done and all of a sudden it was like, well, what do we do with it? Because originally he was just gonna go in and make a single. Um, so the conversation really, and I'll make this kind of quick, was is that he was gonna put the entire album out at once. But the record business couldn't fathom what we wanted to do at that point in time, because the tradition is you put a single out, you wait 90 days, if you have traction on the single, then you put the album. But my thing was, is since there, there's so much buzz, and the fact is people are excited about you coming back after seven years, why make them wait? Let's just give them everything at once. But we couldn't do it because we were under constraints from our record label not to do it that way. Um, and then, of course, Beyonce has come out, and since then, Kanye, so that's now becoming the norm. But I want everyone to know that, you know, this was Justin's thought pattern at the beginning, was to give you the entire 2020 experience at once. Amazing. So, you hear the 26 songs, you've always guided Justin in terms of what songs are good, because this goes back to your own background. When you started out working in radio, basically using your ears to find new talent, when you were basically working in Massachusetts uh, in radio and uh, uh, developing uh, a whole feel for A&R and uh, just a whole way of basically determining which songs found a connection to the audience. So let's just go back to uh, your... Oh, here's uh, something particularly of use for Canada. This is a certification received in Canada from Canadian sales for this 2020 album, correct? Correct. I love Canada. What, why do you love Canada? Canada's always been good to us. Much music, music plus the radio stations. You know, for us, it's always been, and I hate to say this sometimes about American music, you know, gatekeepers as I call them, but sometimes if it doesn't fit in the box, they don't want to know about it. Huh. And Canada was one of those markets that if it sounded good to them, we'll play it. We don't care about what box it sits in. Amazing. And we've always loved that aspect of the, what I call the gatekeepers of Canada. And the music bleeds over because the stations come across into the American marketplace. So some Americans that are listening to Canadian radio all of a sudden start saying, well, how come that song is not playing right. here? And it helps us push, push them over the edge. Well, it's great to hear that you have this respect for the Canadian uh, listener, the Canadian music subscriber, the Canadian way of appreciating good music and good songs. So great also to see that Justin getting this uh, big award for an album that clearly was in the grooves that you basically helped put together. Yes, it was great. Very good. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Here's uh, another act that you currently manage. Uh, how many of you in the audience can recognize who these three blokes are in the slide? Not all of you. Well, who are, who are these three chaps? Well, those are the Jonas Brothers. The Jonas Brothers. Good <laughs> act. Not a word from anybody. How many of you are Jonas Brothers fans? Very good. Okay, so that, that's an uh, interesting uh, look and uh, good guys you've been working with now for some time. Yes, actually, a um, quick story about that was is that they weren't a group. It was just Nick, and Nick was doing a solo gospel career. Wow. <clears throat> and he was doing a morning TV show at 5.30 in the morning on CBS, and I got a call to go take a look at him. And I was like, I don't get out of bed for anyone at 5.30 in the morning. Oh. But something, there was just something about what I had heard about Nick that made me want to go. And when I went there, he was performing on the show, and his brothers was his backup band. So as the music business plays out, uh, there was a change of the guard at the label that he was at, and they were going to drop Nick 
And so the president of the label called me and said, why should I keep this kid? And I said, because he's very talented. I said, but he's really talented with his brothers. And this guy was, his name was Steve Greenberg. And Steve Greenberg had put together Hanson. So I said, if you think about it, and you've got three more brothers similar to what Hanson was. So if we can get them all to agree to be a band, lightning could strike twice for you. And that's what ended up happening, and that's how the Jonas Brothers started. And Steve Greenberg is a well-known and great A&R guy from New York, but you were the one that came up with the idea of making sure that they were with someone that could really appreciate their longer-range talent. Absolutely. Amazing. See, there's a real skill to this. This is not just something that happens. This is something where someone who's got an innate understanding of music and the way of really putting things together that texturally, musically, lyrically, that's really the mark of a great manager. Oh, here we are. This is, uh, this is the workplace. Yeah, this is inside the compound. We have a bowling alley. We have a movie theater. We have... Oh two recording studios, a rehearsal facility. It also has a five bedroom house that's connected to you. So when you come to the compound, you live, eat, sleep, perform, record, and rehearse there. It's one stop. And that's really what I'm involved in is the development of artists. Because even though everything begins and ends with the song, once the song connects, you have to connect. And there's so many artists right now, and I tell this story all the time, that get millions of plays online and get millions of plays on radio, and they sell singles, but they can't sell 200 tickets at the House of Blues because as an artist, they haven't made a connection, but the music has, but they haven't, the music and the artist haven't caught up together. And you ask sometimes, where are these, why are we here so much about one hit wonders? And it's simply because the song was a hit but the artists never were. And you have to question sometimes, if you take that song and you put it on any good singer or rapper, would it have still been a hit? And 99% of the time, the answer is yes, because the song was bigger than the act. And so for what I've created was an opportunity to really fine tune the talents, not only on performing, but we also do media training and all the things that are necessary for you to be engaged to a fan base that really want to love you as, as an artist and not just a song. So the thing is this, uh, in today's world of Spotify, Deezer, RDO, streaming, Digitalia, all of that kind of stuff, live has become increasingly important. So when you are working with your talent, a big, big focus is on making sure their performance and their performance ethic works really effectively as performers. Yeah, I'm a manager, so for me to be excited about someone, it's not even so, so much at first place finding the song, because the songs will come if they're talented and we put them around great producers and songwriters, but it's really making sure that that person that I sign has the goods on stage. And also there's this, this thing too that sometimes you can come sing in front of me and I think you have a great voice, and you can get on a stage right now and kill this audience, but the minute that I put you in the booth, you freeze up, huh. and I can never get that same quality in the booth. So for me, both things have to connect. You have to be great in the booth, and you have to be great on stage, and that's really what I look for first. We will find the song from that point on. So this is really a, a broad-based uh, kind of discipline that you're looking for, but fundamentally, you'd mentioned earlier about Justin Timberlake having this drive and this intense ambition. Can you sense kind of almost immediately if someone who's a really good talent has also got that <clears throat> extra special quality. I mean, how do you identify that, Johnny? You know, again, I have to give God credit for this because in 30 seconds of meeting someone and listening to them, I can tell whether there's really something to work with. Mm -hmm. And I can go back and I won't give any names, but there's certain artists that I had that if I played you the first demos that they did in studio, you would go, oh, and never believe that they became the act or the artist that they become. And again, sometimes it's in you, you just don't have the proper training. And again, this is why I keep going back to the compound. This is the place where you, it's almost like a school. So in the morning, if you are you know, a minor, you have to go to class. Then you have to go to physical training. Then we put you through vocal training. Then we put you through dance training. And then after all that's done, we then put you in the studio at 10 o'clock at night and you start working on your sound. And this is what happens over and over and over again. And we'll get to an artist that I have at the compound right now. Well, we'll do that in just a minute. Okay. But before we do that, 
Uh, what is that space there? I mean, it looks like a nice, uh, a nice view of uh, water and all that stuff. It looks very idyllic. Uh, really, it looks more like a like a summer camp than it does. But but that basketball court has got special relevance. Tell us why. Well, at the compound, like I say, we make it so it's a creative place, not only to create music and your craft, but also so if you have a a block, then you can go and play basketball. You can go fishing. You can go for a swim. But it also has a double meaning what the basketball court is. One of the first places for my acts that once they get a hit record or start to build on a record, they go out and do shows. And a lot of shows that you have to do might be outdoors. They could be state fairs, amusement parks, or whatever. So if you look, there's a set of lights that overlook the basketball court. And it's a lighted basketball court. But at night, we turn the lights on so the bugs, because this is Florida, and we have mosquitoes and moths and everything else coming out at night. And we make you perform, because I want the moths and the mosquitoes to come and bite you, and I want them ah. to fly around your face. Because these are all real experiences that are gonna happen to you when you're out playing shows at night, or state, especially state fairs. Um, and if you don't know how to deal with that, the first time a moth or something flies in your face and you're supposed to be doing choreography and instead you're going like this, the audience is gonna be turned off by you. So this is one of the ways that we get people prepared for, for the next level of, of touring of what they have to actually do. So you also gotta give them some mosquito repellent. Make no, sure that they don't get, get bit too much. Because again, unfortunately, this is just the, that's the nature of the beast. And right. you know, with Justin and Insync and Backstreet Boys and all, and Britney Spears, all those acts that became major superstars, we all started on the state fair and amusement park, and right. every one of them's gone through an experience like that. Incredible, but also the whole notion of making sure that you could take from what was developed within the complex and getting fit and doing dance routines and getting your costumes fitted or whatever the clothing was gonna be and then making sure that that could be translated into a physical live environment is just uh, pretty broad. Here's uh, an interesting shot. That's you sitting there. I'm glad to see you holding your phone. Obviously you're keen about getting to screen ages, but uh, that studio you're working in, uh, tell us about this picture. Uh, well, this is just a session that I have with one of my upcoming artists, and Tim Miller is a sound engineer, and he's worked with me all the way from uh, New Kids on the Block. Right now, he's out with Megan Trainer, And that's the other thing, too. We have a school in Florida called Full Sail. He worked on, uh, on the Megan Trainer hit? He's actually out with her as her live sound engineer uh -huh. right now. So he's, doing, he's a production manager and sound engineer for her. Yeah. So he knows about the bass. Oh, he knows all about the bass, yeah. Very good. <laughs> Nice. Um, but this is, <laughs> you know, so again, this, this is me. I'm what's called the 2% guy when it comes to producing records. Like, I'll come in at the last minute and give you my 2% and mm. what I think should change or what not change. I don't have a patience, and I'll be the first to acknowledge that, to sit there and watch you go through note, through note, through note, through note for hours at a time. So right. I let the producers do that, and then when it comes to the point that everyone feels they have something, then I'll come in and give my 2%. And this is me giving my 2% at that point in time. But that 2% is almost like getting the secret sauce when you're just about to put something into the oven. Because well, that, all of your experience of really being a song guy for years and also having an understanding of what the people, what, the, what someone who hears music for the first time, whether it's on the radio or online or uh, uh, on some kind of mixtape, I mean, you've just got this innate feel that you can somehow recognize a chorus, a lyric. Uh, well, again, my training from radio also, I was a nightclub disc jockey, so I understood what to play to make people dance. I was a roller skating DJ, so I oh. knew what kept people moving around. And I was a wedding DJ, so it's oh. playing music for kids between 6 and 60 and making sure that the dance floor is never cleared. But with radio, the thing always was for me, if I didn't hear something that sparked me in the first 15 seconds of a record, it never made it on a station. And so with that is what I take into the records that you know, I'm involved with my artists right now, that the first 15 seconds of that record has to capture someone, or it's not a hit, and we have to move on to the next record. So you're always looking for the cheerful earful. That's what you need. Okay, here, uh, this is a dance studio. Yeah, this is our, um, our dance studio. And everything, in every room that we have too, we have cameras set up, so if we want to stream anything, online of some of the performances. I 
don't happen to be there, but someone's going through a routine that I really need to see, it beams right into my phone or my computer so I can give my 2%. So. Oh, so you get it live online from the dance studio directly oh, onto your computer? Absolutely, yeah. Incredible. I mean, have you, I, this is the modern way of doing stuff. It also develops something for online because clearly online is just so important. Uh, absolutely. Certainly, uh, young people from 12 to 28, their main access node will be the mobile device. Absolutely. It's something that's going to happen in the future is we're going to, and, and I don't think we have a picture of that, but we have a, a, an actual stage that's a little upstairs in one of the, the areas of the compound. And we're setting it, it up right now because we're going to do these things called live from the compound, where if there's any artist that's in town or if, there's, if we really want to get feedback directly from the fan base on someone's performance on the song before we put it out, they will perform it live at, at, at the compound and you can go on our website and actually give us feedback on what do you think of the song, what do you think of the performance. And this is one of the extra tools in the future that we're going to do in order to, for these talented artists to get themselves ready before they actually go on a road and put it in front of people that are paying money to see it. And of course also as a means of developing the wider performance skills so that when people do see them, the performance makes an impact in the, as much as the music makes an impact. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, a song is a song, but a performance to a song makes an artist, and that's what I believe. Incredible. Okay, so here's another picture of one of the, the studio in the complex, and I thought it would be interesting for everyone here today to see some of the people that you manage. Of course, uh, NSYNC, a uh, modern version. Uh, these are some of the names, uh, Incubus, uh, Lorianne Gibson, Lance Bass, who was originally with NSYNC, correct? Um, and uh, just some of the names of the people that you represent. Studio is a studio, is a studio, but uh, just to give a sense of the fact that you're not just a one-trick pony, it's not just Justin Timberlake, it's not just what you did with uh, Britney or what you did with the Backstreet Boys, you're constantly on the lookout for something that's coming next that can tap into the next generation. You're always looking to see you someone who looks to the future. You don't dwell on the past even though you've got such uh, such a distinguished past in terms of what you've developed. Your focus has always been on what's coming next. Well, I mean, to coin Janet, you know, what have you done for me lately, you know? So it's, again, I'm very happy and blessed and proud of the artists that I had in the past, but, you know, I enjoy what I do. I've been blessed enough to have success in this business that I don't have to do it for a job. I do it because I love it. And so for me, and, and also I've been blessed that in each decade I have had a artist that's become a global success. So I'm now starting my next decade and now it's time for me to present who's going to be that next global act to the world. Okay, well let's take a look at what you're going to be doing with uh, the, the next global. Uh, here's a picture, and uh, before we go into some of the detail here, if you look at this picture, this is part of Johnny's whole new chapter. And this new chapter, ladies and gentlemen, as you'll discover in just a few seconds, is really both exciting, right on the cutting edge, the bleeding edge of what's coming next, but also more importantly, is really a very, very good example of the way that you fashioned out creatively what you think should happen. So before we explain what this is, let's go to the next slide and explain to us what Pop Nation is. So Pop Nation is a new brand that I've created um, that's gonna encompass everything that I've been talking about today. It's, it's not a new idea, it's actually an old idea that I wanna bring forward. So back in the day of Motown, Barry Gordy had a vision. He had, you know, called Hitsville, and that was a place Barry Gordy was the founder of Motown. Some people who might not All right. be familiar. I keep, I'm Detroit, not far from my Toronto. Age now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but but what, what it was, was it was a location, kind of what I have, where artists could go and train and be artists. They recorded, they wrote, um, they rehearsed. Um, and what they used to do is they used to all pile up on a bus together and they have the thing called the Motown Review and the Supremes, Four Tops, Temptations. Everybody would go out on the road together. What they didn't have was social networking. 
So with Pop Nation, it's creating that same idea where, where it's one location at the compound that we sign acts to Pop Nation. Some of them might be signed strictly under management. Some will be signed to a record deal because we'll, we're doing independent distribution through Carolina Universal. But when I sign an act into the record label, it's not like I'm signing you and you now work for me. We're joining together as a joint venture so that you are the partner with me and we're the label together. And then from that, we're going to have our other verticals. So there'll be a Pop Nation TV, so we'll create web series or whatever we need to do to put you out online. We have a radio station being created with Dash.com, Dash Radio. And so we'll have our own radio that will play your music and the other Pop Nation artists. There's a Pop Nation tour, and there'll be three of them that'll go out this year. And so we're like the Motown days. We'll put all our acts together, and we'll take them out on the road, and we're all driving everybody to our Pop Nation brand, but these are ways that these artists have an opportunity to connect to a fan base. Um, so, so that's really what Pop Nation is. It's an experience, and it's not only live experience, it's creative, and it's also social. So the, the reason for calling it Pop Nation is not just because, it's because it's popular. Popular, yeah. Not just because it's pop music, because music has got many different stripes. Absolutely. The popular. Popular. Populist. Right. Cool. And it's, when I say nation, the nation is really global. So it could be anywhere in the world that we take this. Yeah, because you've had a lot of experience with the global markets. You've had such big hits all over the world. Absolutely. That you've realized that, yes, you're developing things in Florida at uh, your compound, but you could be having an impact in the, in the UK, in Germany, in Japan, in all over the world. That's very important. Well, even at an early age, I learned, you know, Backstreet Boys and NSYNC didn't start in the US. Their career started in Germany, and they right. started at a time where uh, social networking wasn't around. So they would play to 30,000 people in Germany and come back to America, which we called no fan land because nobody knew no where they were. No fan land. You know? And unfortunately, when they got press in Germany, it meant nothing in the U.S. because half the people in the U.S. couldn't read German. So now, with you know, the advent of social networking, we could start a Pop Nation Act anywhere in the world, and right. we can grow it across the world through our social networking platforms. And interesting, one of the artists you manage, Akon, did something just like that, recorded a song in Hindi. Right. He doesn't speak Hindi, but he did in Hindi, major Indian language, uh, was featured in a major Bollywood movie and got nearly 15 million Facebook followers as a result of that, exactly. of getting the pop nation internationalized. Okay, let's take a look at, uh, this is something that you did in December, which is what? So in December, I wanted to do a trial of what the Pop Nation tour was going to be. So I took some of the acts that are signed under the Pop Nation umbrella. And the way we based it was on their own social networking. So we did have a local radio station that was involved in, but most of the fan base that came to this was all through the social networking on the fan, by the fans or the artists that were on tour. And this was the, for me, it was kind of like a test just to see how it was going to go and what kinks I might need to work out as we move to tour across the country and across the world. And I'm glad to say it was a super success. So if you look at these names here, these, this is all new talent that you've discovered. Absolutely. And that you basically are grooming and developing and putting through your training mechanisms and your creative uh, uh, college, I guess you could call it, where you basically are providing these opportunities. And, but you've already made the decision that these particular artists have got something special that will have some kind of impact yes. on a national or, a, or an international basis. Restless Road, um, if you watched uh, X Factor, you know, they were put together by Simon Cowell and X Factor. They didn't win, and so usually what happens with these shows that people don't win, they get lost. I saw something special in them, especially in the country world, so they signed up with us, and now we're about to sign to a major label, country label. Round Two Crew, um, they put a song out and a video out. They had over two and a half million views on their own in six weeks, and they brought the single to number 11 on iTunes on their own. And through that situation, we were able to get them a deal with Atlantic Records. Alex Allegro is one of the first kids that I see that's not only a DJ, but he's a singer and he's a dancer. So I look at him as a triple threat. There's a lot of majors that are interested in him right now, and he'll be going out on the Pop Nation tour. Dylan Hyde signed to Motown. Luke Potter is a singer-songwriter from the UK, and right now through our Pop Nation situation, we're building a fan base for him in the US. 
Caitlin J, we'll talk about her in a minute. Carson Luters is a little 12 year old kid that I found online, but he has 1.6 million followers. And he's How did you find it online? My staff, I have to give yeah, all you got a whole team. I have a team, yeah. So well, Melinda Bell, who found him and said, you really have to check this guy out. So I did, and I went and took a, you know, I met with his family, and his family was cool, which was important to me, and he's hungry. He, there's a passion in this kid that I haven't seen at that age since Justin. So, so, and he passed the 15 second test with you? Oh, absolutely. Well, he, he was doing covers. So obviously I have to find the record for him, but him as a performer, artist, his swag, his personality, yeah, he, he, he's gonna be something to reckon with in the future. But you're gonna recognize the things. Well, you know what, Johnny, I'll tell you what might be interesting, and I don't know if you're even aware of this. I've got a video that I dug up that I <laughs> thought would be uh, interesting to show all of our friends here in Canada about some of the stuff that you do. So check this out. Johnny Wright with Pop Nation. We want to introduce some of that you might know and some that you never heard of before. We're going to give some of the acts the first time on stage to perform in front of a live audience, and we're going to give you a taste of what the next generation of world superstar is going to be. So again, thank you for participating. Thank you for coming to the show. Thank you for watching here on PopNationTV.com and PopNationTour.com. Wow, Johnny, this is, I can see now what you mean. You've identified these. I mean, what do you think of that, ladies and gentlemen? That's pretty amazing to put all this together. Well, I, I can't take credit for Osky. Osky happens to go to my daughter's school, and for about six months, she kept telling me about this girl who plays around in school, and I was like, yeah, 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 whatever, whatever. So when, when this show happened to come up, I said, well, you know what, I'm going to give her a shot. I'm going to put her on and let her be the opening act. And she was the, this was the first time she ever played in front of an audience like that, and she blew us all away. So props to my daughter for having a good eye, too. Incredible. So I mean, it's just a, just a fascinating way in which this, this is not the usual cliched expectation of what one sees in the music business, because you're taking this broad, holistic view about how you develop something. And when you'd mentioned Pop Nation TV, uh, uh, popnationtv.com, right? Right. Just tell us about what your view is for developing this as a kind of TV platform, particularly because you know about screen ages. So Pop Nation TV is going to be kind of what MTV used to be, where not only just the artists that we have signed up the Pop Nation, but anybody that we feel is up and coming and relevant, we'll put their videos on Pop Nation. As the tourists start to go out, we'll create web series around the artists that are on the tour, and we'll have specialty shows that will actually play on the network. So it'll be 24 hours of Pop Nation, the artists that we represent, artists that are up and coming, artists that are friends of some of the acts that we have. One of the other things I just want to say real quick is, when you become a part of something that I'm doing moving forward with Pop Nation, we don't have a time limit. We don't say that it has to be out in six days or it has to be out in six weeks. I think that's the problem with the music business right now. Everybody feels like we have to have something that pops right now. So, so many things get signed and gets thrown up against the wall and they only chase the things that seem to stick. I have a different approach on that. I mean, I have this girl, Caitlin J, who's actually been at the compound now for a year and a half. And the reason why she's not come out yet is because we've been developing the sound. And even herself as a performer needed to really be developed. But she went along with the program understanding that what I'm looking to do is not build a song and an artist, but I'm look, looking to build a brand. And when you think about it today, Christina Aguilera, Justin Timberlake, 
we, who can you really identify? There's only a handful of people that you say are gonna be around in 10 years that you really feel give you the 360 of everything. You know, we have plenty of acts out there that have hit songs and you see them around for a song or two, but are they gonna be around five albums from now? And so what I'm trying to do is to take something old school and develop it with the technology and the platforms of the new school, but it's not about chart position for us because we don't care what chart position is. We, case in point with NSYNC, even taking it way back, when NSYNC was like in the US, their album was hovering at 66. They had only sold about 100,000 records. Now I know that sounds a lot for today, but back then it meant nothing. So at the end of the run of that first NSYNC album, 12 months later, they had sold 15 and a half million albums. But they never got to number one, and so we didn't care. We cared about not where we began, but where we ended up. And it was a lot better for us not to be at number one at 100,000 and then lose the promotion value. It was better for us to continue to build to 15 and a half million albums, and that's, that's what it's all about for me. So Johnny, when you, when you develop these things, you're looking at the performance, you're looking at the music, you're looking at the music publishing, the songwriting, you're looking at the merch that can be developed alongside it, you're looking for these new online and on mobile opportunities that can be developed. So really looking at this broad kind of approach. Um, when you spoke about developing the worldwide appeal for something like Pop Nation, are you saying that you also have a concerted effort in terms of online such that you could be developing these pockets of a following from all over the world because sometimes you might be able to get some breakthrough like you did in Germany with NSYNC or maybe you might get some breakthrough in, let's say you get a breakthrough in uh, Indonesia, in Jakarta because people are watching online, there are people living in North America, particularly a city like Toronto, so many people uh, in Toronto who are not necessarily born in Toronto, right. but still maintain their linkage with their home audience from countries they came from. So someone sees something online here or in Florida, they'll then email that to someone in India or in Europe or in Sweden or in Finland or in Africa. Uh, this is all part of your wider, bigger thinking. Oh, absolutely, and again, it's you know, again, it was proven in the past. Everything with Backstreet Boys and NSYNC started in Germany. So it, to me, it doesn't have to start here. Ultimately, America's the biggest music market in the world, and you want to be successful here, but you don't have to start here. Agnes Mo is a lady that I have right now. She's from Indonesia. She is huge. She has five and a half million followers in Indonesia and is a big pop star. No one knows of her here, but she had a thing called a pink in, uh, folder. And she wrote down certain people that she wanted to work with in America in her pink folder, and that's what she set out to do. I was one of them, Laurie Ann Gibson as a choreographer, Timberland was one of them. And for her tenacity, she got to all of us. And her first single was a song called Coke Bottle that has T.I., Timberland, I'm involved, Laurie Ann was the choreographer. And when you hear a story like that from someone from another country, even though they're super successful and they understand that they have to come here and start from the grassroots all over, that's something she wanted to do. That's what I'm intrigued and interested in. Think pink. Excuse me? Think pink. Think pink, yes. Exactly. Yeah. That's what you've got to do. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Johnny, let's uh, take a look at, uh, here you are, uh, obviously, in a, in a conversation with excuse, talent. Who is excuse this? Excuse that picture. I'm sorry. I didn't even know where that got in there. This is Caitlin J. So, I was involved in an online talent competition a couple of years ago. And what, the reason why I got involved with it is because I wasn't a judge. I was a mentor. All I had to do was come and give my opinion on things. Each one of the contestants in the show had to write original songs. And then the audience that watched the show voted based on the artist in the original song, and the winner got signed to my management company. And I liked it because it wasn't a glorified karaoke show like we see now where people are trying to cover other people's music. It was really about your talent to the music that you write, and the fans were the only ones that voted on it. And so Kaylin became the winner. Um, the song was good, but there was something about her personality and things that I liked about her, and we've spent all this time right now really building on her sound right now, and we think we finally have it. And Justin actually coined it to me when he made the 2020 experience. He said, all the EDM and everything that's out there is great. He said, but I want to make a record that has music that takes you back into the pocket. And the pocket simply means the bass and the drum. And so 
she's got an old soul, even though she's only 21 years old, and those are the type of music styles that, that move her. So we finally found the right writers and producers who are making music for her that's in the pocket, and she'll be releasing an album sometime in September this year after a year and a half of being at the compound. But she's okay with that, because she'd rather take the slow boat than the fast one and, and, and end up having it capsize on her. I see that the title of this uh, album jacket is uh, Finally. Is that <laughs> yeah. because of the one and a half years? Yeah. Of Finally. Finally, absolutely. So yeah. when you said that you were, you were shaping and sculpting the, the sound, in what way do you mean by that? What well, do you mean by again, that? Again, uh, sometimes a person, a talent will come to you, and they might have written records, but they're just not the songs that you know are instantly going to be accepted by radio and uh, by the world. So, so she didn't really have her sound figured out. So it was our, so we tried many things because she was young and we took her through the dance thing and we took her through the pop Britney thing and just looking at it and seeing her movement through the time that we had at the compound, none of it seemed to connect. And then one day, you know, um, Polo DeJohn, who's a big producer who produces a lot of big acts, you know, was in my studio. He was at the compound actually working with other artists and he met Caitlin and he said, I have a song for her. And so he played the song for us and she recorded it. And we were like, ah, a year later, that's it. So we, we finally realized that that was the sound that she needed to explore. And we just started making the record from there because we now had a clear vision on what we needed to do. Where's she from originally? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh huh. So Philadelphia always had a good musical heritage, Gamble and Huff, that whole era. Well, I mean, again, the way she came to me, and there's no disrespect to anybody as a cheerleader, but she was a pop girl cheerleader. A lot of her movement was very cheerleader style, and that you know, those were the songs that she was used to singing. But when you really sit down and have a conversation with her, and you start saying, "Who's who's on your iPad?" and she starts telling you, Mariah Carey, and you know just different people that have soul and they're, they're artists that have music that's in the pocket. And when it took Polo to really bring that out, but once he did, we, we realized exactly what she wanted to be. So we don't want her to dance. She doesn't need 16 dancers behind her. She's going to be a vocalist and she's going to have a live band behind her. And that's how we're going to present her as a real singer and vocalist and performer. So the whole chasing after Ariana Grande or chasing after Britney Spears, which is what the original thought was, right. was completely scrapped because that's not truly who she is. Authenticity is such a key, key thing of today's artistic development, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Well, so right on, Johnny. Right is right on. Johnny, we've got uh, time, just a few more minutes, and I'm sure people here would like to pose a question to you because after hearing this, I mean, I'm just so stimulated by the fact that your approach to this is rooted in talent, music, uh, performance, all of the key, key elements that make great, long-range, durable artists. So, uh, we got a mic somewhere uh, here. Let's uh, ask this uh, very good-looking gentleman here in the front. Okay, hi, uh, tell us your name, where uh, you're from, and then pose the question to Johnny. All right, hi, uh, my name is Pierce, I'm from Toronto. Um, and I was just wondering, when you have an artist uh, and you have, you know, a bunch of acoustic demos, and they have kind of a, a wide uh, range of styles that they're comfortable performing in. How do you kind of gear towards what direction you think that they should go in if, say, you know, they could be a singer-songwriter, or they could do electro-pop, or maybe they can rap, and how do you decide, or just try to have, get a game plan, so to speak? Well, with a, a singer-songwriter, is really about the song that they write and the emotion that they create with the song. And does it really connect to everything that's about their personality that related to them? You know, I get people who want to be John Mayer all the time, but they they want to sing John Mayer, but they're not John Mayer, and every and anything about their character, their personality, can't pull that off. So, um, again, then you find the right writer and producer who can help structure that that sound that's needed in order to bring out what's truly inside of them. And that's kind of how we move forward. Let's, uh, any ladies in the house? Uh, there's a very good looking lady right there. Tell us your name, where you're from, and hit Johnny on the spot. I can't hold it, okay. Uh, my name is Jennifer Levy. I'm a rock soul singer and songwriter. Um, where are you from? Um, I'm in Toronto now. I was born in Winnipeg, but I spent time in New York and Nashville, and I, I just moved here to be with family. 
Anyway, I'm a rock soul singer and songwriter. Think like Joe Cocker at Woodstock meets Otis Redding. You'd never know it looking at me, but um, <laughs> yeah, and I have a lot of soul. I write all my own music. But anyway, so I'm just wondering, do you typically only work with people you have to develop, or do you work with people that know who they are and are already? Oh, absolutely not. If you know who someone. you are and you bring the sound, and it just makes our life easier. Yeah. We have the facility there if you need it, but if you're ready to go, that's what we're creating the Pop Nation platforms for us to be able to instantly start to take you to radio, take you out on tour, and put your records out. And again, the independent scenario of what we're doing, you own all your masters, you don't have to give up your 360, but if you happen to get a song that actually starts to create some noise, all the majors are gonna come. And when that ends up happening, then the deal that you make with them is structured the way you want to make it, and you're not just getting some entry-level slave deal that you're going to be stuck with for the next seven years. But yes, so the answer to your question is, if you bring something to me that is ready to go and it inspires me, you know, we're ready to go. So. Uh, let's take a question at the back uh, from, uh, let's see, that gentleman, uh, yes, you got one? Tell us your name and where you're from. Uh, Jonathan Parker from Toronto, Ontario. Um, just a quick question. Uh, I do artist management all over Toronto here and whatnot. On you know becoming the partnership with you and the artists, um, behind that is the business side. What on average uh, do you take percentage of the artist? Whatever I can get. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, look, I, I don't think there's any industry standard. And, you know, you propose something and then it goes back and forth until you're both comfortable. Um, I will say this though, you know, my moving forward with Pop Nation is becoming more of a partner with the artist and less of the manager. Manager is the job description that's part of what I'm doing as a partner. But as a manager, you know, we're, an, we're a service employee to the act. And we have no equity into that act. So. One morning, the artist wakes up and decides they don't like the color of your shirt and you're fired, you're gone. And all your relationships and all your hard work that you've developed into that act is gone. So why you make sure you have the sunset clause, right? Sunset clauses, you know, they, they don't, they don't, you won't put your kids through college on a sunset clause. But my vision in the future is that, is, is that if you're a manager who, there are these managers who are simply out there just to maintain the day-to-day -day of an artist. Then there's a manager who is really in the creative process of building what that art artist is, having those relationships. And so I feel I put myself in that category. And for that, I sometimes believe that I should be a partner with you less than just being a service employee. I think we've got time for, <laughs> very good. It's absolutely dead right. Uh, let's ask that lady over there. Um, Tell us your name and where you're from. Hi, my name is Crystal Yang. I'm from New York City. Um, I work with some of the biggest labels and artists out of Korea, a lot of the K-pop artists. Um, I'm also a concert promoter. Um, one thing I'm kind of curious about is, do you only work with emerging artists, or are you also interested in potentially working with some major K-pop artists who might be interested in breaking into this market, but you know, coming up against some of the hurdles um, that you find regularly within the industry and breaking into a new market. Well, if you're speaking of K-pop artists as it pertains to breaking them in the United States, I'm always open for it. There are some great acts out of the K-pop, 21, um, Big Bang. Again, if they actually would turn their music into English with their style, and, and, and even, again, not understanding the language, but just listening to the vibe of their music, could have hits. I actually did work for a short period of time with the Wonder Girls. And just on the verge of us actually breaking them over the top 20 position on the record charts, they went back home for three weeks and broke up. So, <laughs> you know, so it was out of my control. But I, I understand the whole, and again, obviously we all know Psy. And I think for, you know, as much as that was a novelty and had success, the sad thing was is that everyone in America, the gatekeepers felt that that's what K-pop represented. And I know Very differently nice. that there's a whole lot of credible and great sound and great artists in the K-pop world, and I would love to have another opportunity to work with them. <laughs> we have to come to an end, unfortunately. Our time is up. But I'm sure that you'll join me in just really respecting and taking great note of the fact that here with us, one of the great managers, creative managers, musical managers, please give Johnny a big, big warm round of applause. Thank you.